Tonight on Politicat, will it be a long haul for the expected tax overhaul? Our panel weighs in. President Trump wraps up nearly two weeks in Asia. We go global with Eric Miller. And protected no more, the administration considers ending temporary protected status for some refugees. Plus, we have politics and policies David Gernon back in the studio to discuss this week's 2-in-1. All that and more coming up tonight on Politicat. It's your political news right, right now. now. Good evening and welcome to Politicat. I'm Tyler Kendall. And I'm Andrew Merica. Thanks for joining us. We'll get to those stories and our panel in a moment, but first, this week's headlines. Twitter means trouble for Trump, and this time it's not the president but his son, Donald Trump Jr. He exchanged multiple private messages during the 2016 campaign with WikiLeaks. So far, none of the conversations made public show deliberate solicitation of WikiLeaks help, especially in connection with the DNC email scandal. Rather, WikiLeaks was the one soliciting Trump Jr. The messages primarily show Trump Jr. tweeting out links that WikiLeaks sent him and asking about leaks in advance of their publishing. For now, he seems to be in the clear and we'll keep you updated as this story develops. Another special counsel probe? Monday, the Justice Department said it's looking into whether one should be appointed to investigate the president's political rivals, including Hillary Clinton. The president has been vocal about pushing for an investigation into donations to the Clinton Foundation and their ties to an Obama-era decision that allowed a Russian nuclear agency to buy a mining company with access to uranium deposits in the U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions appeared on the Hill today and did not take a side on the issue, leaving the likelihood of the probe and the motivations behind it up for debate. Calls have increased for Roy Moore, the GOP candidate for Alabama's vacant Senate seat, to quit the race after allegations of sexual misconduct with minors were published in the Washington Post that last week. Yesterday, a fifth woman accused Moore of sexually assaulting her when she was 16. Moore, a former judge who has been twice removed from the Alabama Supreme Court, has so far denied the allegations and has refused to step down. Moore and his campaign claim the story is a fabrication intended to ruin his political career, but evidence to the contrary is mounting including a yearbook owned by one of his accusers with signature and address in it, as well as reports that he was banned from a mall in Alabama for trying to pick up teenage girls. Yesterday, the Congressional Budget Office announced that it would be unable to release a full assessment of the House version of the Republican tax overhaul set to be voted on this Thursday. The tax bill, which must be reconciled with another version of the bill that will be passed by the Senate, is a rare opportunity for the GOP due to its control of both houses of Congress and the presidency. See, passing the House and the Senate may be the easy part, but reconciling the two final bills will be a unique challenge due to multiple key differences between the House and Senate plans. The House bill reduces the number of income tax brackets to four, while the Senate keeps the current seven with minor changes. Causing particular strife is the question of state and local tax deductions, which benefit citizens from high tax states such as New York, California, and Illinois. The House bill places limitations on the so-called assault deductions, while the Senate bill does away with them entirely. Several other discrepancies promised to make the reconciliation phase an interesting political event, but that's far off. For now, we'll turn to our panel. We're joined tonight by Alex Smith of NU Political Union and Marco Laudati of NU College Republicans. Alex, Marco, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for having us. All right, so Alex, let's start with you. Republican leaders are confident that this bill will pass the House this week. But it looks like the Senate, where the GOP has a much smaller margin, could be a closer call. The Senate has been challenging for Republicans during their last few legislative pushes. Do you think this bill will get stuck there again? Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think that this bill will actually uh, pass into law. Uh, the Republicans are under such uh, extraordinary pressure to have a win in this administration since they've really been, uh, they've failed multiple times to have a, a signature piece of legislation passed in this first year. Uh, and while there are significant uh, discrepancies between the House and the Senate bill, um, the, 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 the pressure on them to pass something big I think will, will kind of reduce the, uh, the, the personalities in that contest to the point where they will be able to reconcile and pass that legislation. Pretty optimistic, Marco. You think so? Um, I, I would like to be optimistic, but I actually think this is a very difficult and complex situation, especially with the uh, implementation of a repeal of the ACA mandate 
that was put in the tax bill. I think that's going to be a very difficult topic, especially with Senate Republicans. And the, the issue of the SALT deductions as well in the House, um, as we look at both um, the Senate bill and the House bill, there are significant discrepancies. And I'm really interested to see how these discrepancies will be addressed if they pass. So I, while I think it, they will eventually work out a solution and pass the bill, I am still extremely unsure over what tax reform or tax cuts will actually look like. If there will be tax cuts, who knows? <laughs> um, hopefully both will happen, but we will see. So to give some background on what you're talking about today, the <coughs> Senate Republicans announced that they were considering to repeal part of Obamacare's individual mandate in their version of the tax overhaul. This would essentially cripple the ACA. So, Alex, what do you think? Do you think that this will help pass along the tax bill? Do you think it will hurt it? Um, what are your thoughts on it? Well, it definitely won't help pass along the tax bill. But my, my personal opinion is that the, uh, the, re the repeal of the mandate is a, is a red herring. Uh, I think that they uh, won't actually stick to that as a real core part of the budget uh, or a part of the tax overhaul. And that when push comes to shove, they'll, they'll back down. Uh, there already is a, uh, a, um, a health care um, overhaul bill in Congress. And it, it wouldn't make any sense to me why they would uh, threaten that previously initiated process by introducing a different uh, uh, policy within the tax bill. Um, and with the, the pressure that's on them to pass this bill, I, I don't think they're going to really hang it up over the uh, individual mandate repeal. Yeah, I would agree, but also would like to say that the reason why they have this is for the purpose of not expanding the deficit or past the 10-year requirement. So I think that this is uh, agreed. It's an initial red herring, but it will be something that will be resolved. And obviously, they're not going to put that in and then not have a plan for health care. This is a tax reform um, project. And I think it was an, an initial push to think about ways that Republicans can work together to maybe keeping some deductions, eliminating some. And I think it was an initial step in saying that we are worried about the deficit. We want tax cuts, but we will be working with the system to figure out the best solution for all the parties involved. And I think it is worrisome that something, a provision like that is included without much, um, I guess, further provisions regarding health care. But I think that um, in the end it will help, it will facilitate discussion about SALT deductions and corporate tax delay and issues such as that. So let's think about the big picture here for a second. We've been talking a lot about these specifics. How important for the GOP is it that this tax bill gets passed? It's being hailed as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to pass tax reforms and breaks. So what does this mean to the GOP that this gets passed? I think it's quite simple that if the Republicans cannot get this passed, they will not be able to control the Senate and House. Um, I think it is that important. And we, we saw with the race in Virginia that, yes, it was expected that the Democrats would win, but not by as large of a margin as they did. And I think that... What is so special about tax reform is that every American physically sees it in their paycheck uh, deduction, and every corporation and, and every every business in America will see cuts, hopefully, and that is something that's tangible and will directly affect how people vote in the election. And if Republicans can't get their act together, then um, their their control of the House and Senate is in jeopardy, I believe. Alex, what's your take on this? Oh, I completely agree. I think um, that the that tax reform has been the cement holding together the Republican parties for the last 25 years. Uh, and if they really fail um, in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pass the tax reform, um, then their voters will respond uh, in kind and uh, fail to elect them uh, back to their positions. Uh, the, the real issue is, as I said before, that they have had no serious win. They, they have nothing to campaign on in 2018 saying, look, we've passed this major bill. Uh, we've done this major service for you, right? All they can say, hey, at this, at, if they fail to pass tax reform, is we've tried and failed to do multiple major initiatives. Uh, and it, it seems I, I have a hard time conceptualizing how they would frame their platform in such a way to retain the support of people who looked, who elected them with a view that they would actually resolve some of these pressing problems. I love the core of that base, though. They just love Trump so much. Do you think that? Even if they love him so much, if they can't get this passed, that's still not enough? Uh, the base loves Trump uh, very much, but remember, he didn't win the popular vote. Uh, the, the, the margin is, is d depends on them having the moderate, the moderate Republicans uh, supporting their positions. And if they, uh, if they fail to, do, to pass the bread and butter reforms that the, those moderate Republicans will be looking to, uh, they'll defect or they won't turn out. Very quickly, Mark. Yeah, I actually think it comes more down to the individual senators and representatives and less so on Trump. Um, 
certainly the Trump effect has played a so, lar somewhat lar uh, negative role in swing states uh, so far in the, in the elections that have uh, occurred. But I think that if a senator is not going to vote for tax reform or they're going to vote to um, repeal the mandate in ACA, then that will have greater effects on each individual senator's elections rather than just the Trump effect in general. And again, I, w I mean, if corporate tax reform or corporate tax and just individual tax reform passes, then these you could people see that as it, and it does will help the economy, it will help the stock market, it will just it'll help create growth. All right. I think that's well, important. Let's see if it does, and that's all the time we have to talk about taxes. We'll be right back with more Politicast. Stay with us. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. for governor coming up on March 20th, candidates are campaigning across Illinois for their place in the general elections. Monday night, the Evanston community and Northwestern students came together for a town hall meeting featuring gubernatorial candidate Daniel Biss. NNN's Lauren Wilkins was there and joins us now with the details. Lauren? That's right. We listened in on the event and had the chance to talk with them one-on-one -on -one after. Monday night, State Senator Biss's main focus was getting Democratic voters excited for a progressive movement in the state of Illinois. He set his campaign apart from others by highlighting his dedication to free and state tuition and universal health care. It's about building the kind of movement that's going to be necessary to create real progressive power so that our tax system, our school funding system, our health care system, our election system, and our wage system all work for ordinary people. Northwestern's College Democrats teamed up with Northwestern's political union to sponsor the event. Alex Newman, president of Northwestern's College Democrats, was glad to see the audience was engaged in conversation with the Evanston State Senator and were able to get a variety of questions answered. I'm actually really happy. Um, a lot of them are students asked a variety of questions, whether it's about the economy, education, social issues, sexual assault. Um, uh, students from Illinois and students who, who reside um, in other states ask questions and I think they all did a great job. Monday's town hall is just one of a series of town halls that the college Democrats have planned leading up to the upcoming elections. Their goal is to have each of the Democratic candidates come to campus for similar discussions regarding their campaign's platforms. Senator Biss currently has his sights set on March 20th for the Democratic primary gubernatorial elections. His opponents include J.B. Pritzker as well as Chris Kennedy. The general elections will be held November 6th of 2018. Lauren, thank you. We will keep you posted on that race and what other candidates have to say in their town halls as well. And now David Gernon, Editor-in-Chief of Politics and Policy, brings us the 2 and one where he'll highlight two stories from last week that haven't been covered enough and one that's been way too overblown. David? Thanks, Tyler. There are two big stories coming out of Saudi Arabia this past week. More than 60 prominent Saudis, including princes, ministers, and prominent businessmen, were arrested ostensibly for corruption. Some observers, however, say that Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the man behind the crackdown, is looking to stifle opposition to his rule. The uncertainty actually caused the price of oil to jump to $62 a barrel, and further economic consequences remain to be seen. Another story we're watching involves Lebanon's Prime Minister Syed Hariri, who resigned 10 days ago while in Saudi Arabia. Hariri cited Iran and Hezbollah's interference in Lebanon and the Middle East, as well as fears of assassination, the same fate which befell his father, who was also Prime Minister, in 2005. No one had heard from him inside Saudi Arabia until today, when he announced he'd be returning home in the next two days. Some are crying foul play, saying he was held hostage. We'll see if he returns home soon. 
Now to Europe, where the King of the Netherlands swore in a new Dutch government last month after the longest coalition talks in its history. What's notable here isn't so much the actual government, which does look tenuous given its small majority, but rather what it represents. That tenuousness is in part thanks to the major parties banding together before March's election against right-wing politician Gert Wilders and his Party for Freedom, which became known for its hardline stance against immigration and Islam. Wilders' defeat, even after Brexit and Trump, showed that nationalistic tendencies don't always win elections. Now the story that has been overhyped in the media, last Tuesday's state elections. Yes, we know Democrats did quite well, winning two governor's mansions and a number of state house seats, but this should come as no surprise, considering the historically unpopular president, not to mention the blue states where the elections were held. It is far too soon to label this a wave election, as much of the media did. In fact, Nate Silver of 538 calculated Democrats could win the popular vote in the House by as much as 7 percent and still end up in the minority. Plus, a CNN poll that came out last week showed favorable ratings for the party at a 25-year low. The Democrats are going to need at least this level of effort and enthusiasm in 2018 to have a chance to regain power nationally. While the Democrats did have a number of uplifting stories Tuesday, it is far too soon to declare them back or the favorites in 2018. And that's the two-in-one for this week. Back to you. Thanks, David. For more in-depth political coverage, you can check out policy and po politicsandpolicy.com. We'll be right back after the break. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Homeland Security announced last week that temporary protected status for Nicaraguans living in the United States would be ending in January 2019. TPS was established as part of the Immigration Act of 1990 for immigrants who can't go back to their home countries due to dangerous conditions like natural disasters or war. TPS designation for Nicaragua came in 1999 after the country was devastated by Hurricane Mitch. Honduras also gained designation because of that hurricane. Citizens of certain countries are typically only granted temporary protected status for a few years. The status for these two countries have been continually renewed until now. While Nicaraguan's status will end in 2019, DHS said the status for Honduras is currently under review and could end as early as this July. This is all part of a larger conversation about immigration policy under the Trump administration. And for that, we'd like to bring back in our panel. All right, guys, welcome back. Estimates show 2,500 Nicaraguan immigrants would be affected and nearly 60,000 Honduran immigrants could be affected by the ending of this program or the status for these people. So is this the right move for the Trump administration right now? Well, at a policy ne level, uh, they definitely need to take a little bit more careful look at this policy and see what they can do to help these people. But at the same time, for Trump and his base, this is a way for Trump to reach his base and to sort of appeal to his um, tough on immigration, uh, normal stances that he has on immigration and refugees and t programs such as TPS. And I think that his base will appreciate this as a first step as Trump has not been able to really address any legislative features that um, have immigration in them. So I think this is very important for him and his um, platform and his f to fulfill his presidential campaign to his base to sort of make a statement of intent saying that, yes, I am tough on immigration tough on refugees and I do want more processes and more reviews to take place of those that are living in the country for extended periods of time. But you don't think it's the best long-term strategy for the president? Um, well for the president I think this might is a good strategy for him uh, but for just immigration policy in general and refugee policy 
I think that there needs to be a more in-depth look at it than just saying that, oh, Nicaraguans, you need to leave, or Honduras, people from Honduras, you need to leave. Um, so I think that, I mean, as we're seeing right now in the Congress, there is a um, bill that's been introduced by a lot of uh, bipartisan South Florida and representatives um, that does take a look at the the people, the people from um, Haiti that are affected by TPS, and I think that a legislative look at this um, program would be a little bit more helpful than the president single-handedly um, addressing it. Alex, your thoughts? Uh, I definitely think it's a bad policy, um, and I think it's a bad political policy as well. Uh, to to re to remove to this. remove okay. this, I would say that uh, it would definitely appeal to Trump's base. But the question is, does Trump need to appeal to his base anymore? They're already pretty firmly in support of him, and they, they still have been throughout his presidency. Uh, the one thing that this will do is galvanize uh, more and more support for uh, Democratic candidates uh, and to increase turnout on the Democratic side. Uh, something something um, along the lines of immigration policy, right? Rem um, uh, removing temporary status uh, from uh, Nicaraguans uh, and, and El Salvadorans and, and Hondurans uh, is something that will, will bring uh, people who care about those constituencies um, to uh, very strongly support the Democratic Party uh, and to turn out in large number against Trump, something that's, that's already been uh, seen in, in recent elections in, say, Virginia. Uh, so political strategy, it appeals to his base, yes. I don't think he needs to appeal to his base anymore, and I think it'll harm him uh, when it comes to attracting center, uh, center voters. Well, I think he does need to appeal to his base because he hasn't had much to show so far, um, especially with the legislative failure. So I think it is very important for him at a political angle to deflect a lot of the controversy regarding Mueller and everything that's going on with him to sort of have this and say to his, his base and voters that, look, I, I can, again, be tough on immigration and refugees. Also, regarding the support for Democrats, again, I would like to bring up that um, bill that's being introduced by a bipartisan um, group of Congress members and in the Miami area regarding Haitians affected by TPS and uh, creating a program that's a path to uh, permanent uh, residency and a path to legalization. Uh, so I think that that is important to look at and sh uh, it demonstrates Republicans and Democrats working together, uh, not at a, at a partisan level, but at a really an agreement saying that we care about our constituents and this is a, it's a bill that is being introduced to directly address constituency. So as long as Republicans are able to address their constituents, as you're saying, that I think that they can attain the support that you say will go to the Democrats. Yeah. I personally, I personally would still say that 80% that of Republicans support Trump, uh, and he's not going to be uh, getting any much more support by, uh, cast, by putting through contentious immigration policy. So on this kind of broader topic of immigration policy, what do you guys think would impact immigration more a wall or cutting things like temporary protected status programs? Alex, we'll go back to you. Oh, definitely uh, temporary status programs. The wall, in my opinion, will do very little. Uh, already, uh, just the threat of the wall has uh, only done, uh, only increased drug trafficking uh, and increased the prices that uh, people who traffic tra trafficking drugs are able to demand for their product. Uh, it won't really help much uh, with um, securing the border. It's more of a, an emotional and a um, a psychological benefit, uh, whereas policies uh, like temporary protected status are, are real tangible benefits to, uh, to uh, specific people. Uh, and if you revoke those, pr those protections, they will be um, allowed to be deported. Uh, and so something of that, of that sort, right, a, a more active deportation, more rev revocal of, uh, um, of those kind of policies will make a big difference in immigration. Yeah, I think now looking back at the Trump campaign, we could say that the wall was more of a statement of intent than anything and a shift in stance for um, being tough on policy regarding immigration. And I think we should expect to see that immigration is the next issue that the Republicans go to and that Trump will definitely be pushing for. So I think in general that um, immigration policy and programs such as these and visa programs has a much greater role than just putting border patrol agents on the border, and we, we will. It will be interesting to see what President Trump uh, begins to look at in the future regarding immigration. All right, we'll have to stop this conversation there. A big thank you to our panelists. The global recap and final word are after this break. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way.
Let's go to us and break right through that. With our colors flying, we will be time. We will cheer you all the go. Go you Northwestern, fight for the drop, sweet victory for the fame of our fair name and go Northwestern, win that game. Go Cats! And now NNN's chief foreign correspondent Eric Miller with this week's Global Recap. Thanks, Andrew. After 11 days jam-packed with trade talks, meetings, and rumblings on U.S. power in the region, President Trump returned today from his marathon trip to Asia. On departing the Philippines this morning, the president hailed what he called the, quote, tremendously successful trip, but the situation on the ground is less clear. President Trump certainly seemed to have an improved relationship over his predecessor with the president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte. At a meeting Monday, the two leaders stressed continued security cooperation as the U.S. assists the Philippine military to push Islamic State-backed rebels out of the country. However, President Trump also took criticism for not pushing the Philippine president on his human rights record. Trade was also top of the agenda. At the Asia-Pacific Economic Conference this weekend, the president continued to push for economic nationalism both at home and abroad. At almost the same time, though, 11 nations agreed to a revised version of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the sweeping multilateral free trade agreement signed by President Obama and abandoned by President Trump on his third day in office. The move was seen by some analysts as a rebuke of both President Trump's isolationist trade policies as well as China's rising influence in the region. And despite a warm welcome from President Xi Jinping of China, Trump, uh, President Trump returns home with limited progress at best dealing with North Korea. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Eric. Now Tyler with the final word. Andrew, the views expressed in this segment are not necessarily the views of NNN or Northwestern University. They are the views of the Politicat editorial staff. The media has become a battle space. This is not a monologue to highlight the already contentious relationship between politicians and reporters that has been especially brought to light in today's politi political climate. No, this is to call attention to news outlets attacking other news outlets that have opposing views to theirs. This week, Breitbart News tried to discredit the Washington Post article accusing Roy Moore of initiating relationships with teenage girls when he was in his 30s by reporting that the Post had contacted the accusers, insinuating it was somehow unethical that it wasn't the other way around. The innate flaws with Breitbart's argument should be obvious, and we couldn't agree more with the Post's reporter Karen Tumulty, who tweeted in response, quote, it's called journalism. The ultimate it was ultimately the accuser's own decisions to talk, if anything, that only strengthens the Post's story. Yet Breitbart is now apparently sending its reporters to Alabama in order to try to discredit the woman who came forward. The media is already under attack. Our own president called journalists, quote, the enemy of the American people. Right before the 2016 election, a Gallup poll found that only 32 percent of American adults had trust in the media. This was an all-time low for the Gallup poll, which has asked this question since 1972. When politics gets messy, upsetting, or contentious, the media needs to remember its responsibility to the American people. We can't forget when President Obama's Treasury Department attempted to exclude Fox News from pool coverage in 2009. The administration ultimately backed down after strong protests from a unified press. CBS White House correspondent Chip Reed described the incident on the evening news as the administration crossing a line. Breitbart's partisan attacks on the Washington Post is crossing a line too. Having a viewpoint is one thing, but trying, but attempting to discredit another outlet by preempting stories with unfounded accusations of foul play and intimidating sources is unacceptable. There is no body that governs the media. It is self-policing. The news media must hold each of its members and organizations accountable. But in order to do that, to remain committed to an objective reality, we cannot start battles based on pure ideology. Breitbart must consider the implications of cry crying wolf every time it disagrees with a story. Doing so deepens the public's distrust of the media and undermines the principles of truth and journalistic integrity. Considering this, it is more important than ever before that the media stick together, hold each other accountable, and not be intimidated to by those who seek to misinform. That's something we can no longer afford. And that's the final word. Thanks, Tyler, and thank you for watching. Good night.